the great pard, emblem of the House of Agen, is fallen. That noble line is unmade, its members in hiding in the provincial keep of South Kirk, its last prince a kitchen serf who answers to the name of Kinch. Hello and welcome to Liam's Lyceum. I am your host Liam, aka Hambar, and today I'll be doing a spoiler-free review of Justin Leiber's The Sword and the Eye. The Sword in the Eye is a 1985 novel by Justin Leiber, son of the famous Fritz Leiber Jr., who is one of my favorite authors, which is why I'm reading this book. Uh, Leiber, this Leiber, at least, is more known, I believe, for his sci-fi, which is what he first released. Uh, but this is a sort of fantasy series that I think might be very well-veiled science fantasy. But it is book one in the saga of the House of Agen, which I believe only ever had two books released. Um, at the start of the story, we have Master Dorant Holdering, who has just turned 14 and been named a man. Celebration in South Kirk is spoiled as Sorgun of Lothia invades. This is a somewhat regular invasion, one essentially paid off like Danes in the Dangeld. Uh, part of the deal is the end of Dorant's house, which is part of, well, through his mother, um, Agent. So he escapes as nobody, kind of, and hides in the town as Kinch. It's really weird how it's kind of like a Domnatio Memoriae, but he's still alive. Uh, this premise is told on the back of the book and vaguely in a little prologue before the first couple chapters, which are really short, actually. Uh, and this shows us how Kinch is born from the ashes of, well, Derwent. Uh, he is a noble of the line of Agen, and the Pard is that house's emblem. Uh, his mentor is Trajus, a warrior, hawked in, inucleated, <laughs> so he cannot walk or see. Um, it's a great contrast, honestly, in this book of battle and peace. Uh, at least very early on there is. The dialogue is very different. Um, it's almost like a play uh, with how straightforward it is. It's also witty and pretty, but not purple or slow. It is a bit archaic. Um, you could say maybe Shakespearean. Uh, for your information, this can maybe be compared to your Edison's style, who the book is dedicated to, among others. It's a coming of age as well, though, with very little of Kinch's inner thoughts. Uh, this showcases the theme of identity. It is also doing something very intentional with language. While it's short and easy to read, if you don't pay attention, you'll get lost. Uh, this means you need to engage with this book missing an identity. Interesting, isn't it? Anyways, you take an angle and say it's about fate, but I don't see it so much myself. Though I think um, it may be more of a critique on religion, like Leiber's dad Fritz is known for. I think that would fit. Uh, the part here, of course, is important. It's a symbol of a noble line no longer recognized. It's an actual part that reminded me some of Drist and Guinevere, uh, though this is older than those books. Uh, and the sword is a sort of heirloom, a singing sword older than the kingdoms um, of with made with a craft that's no longer achievable. Uh, the eye itself is a religion with some sinister motives, um, seemingly. Uh, we don't actually get a ton of it, but um, again, maybe there's some sci-fi connection here, but it's very, very small in this novel. I just, I'm pretty sure you kind of get hints of it, but the biggest hint is the cover of the second novel, which has the laser gun on it. Um, <laughs> so anyways, I actually quite enjoyed this one. It's very short. I thought it was pretty easy to read. It just has a very, I don't know, galloping pace and the style is, I don't know. It's like you're kind of watching it from a stage almost. Uh, it's not exactly a dramatic third person uh, point of view, if I'm remembering correctly, but it almost seems like it at times. So anyways, it's been Liam Williams. I see you next time.